Let go of the past and embrace what you were always meant to be, my morbid little butterfly. Love Without Words by Davio 1986 For how long would you accept being alone? It gnaws at you, even if you would normally hate socializing with other people, find them benign, infuriating, shallow. Or if you're that blindly narcissistic, you find yourself superior in looks, intellect, and physical prowess. For me, that's never been a problem. I wouldn't say that I have looks, but I must have a level of eccentric charm as I haven't been short on friends since high school. And I know how to make girls giggle. <laughs> My profile on Match gushes that I am active, sporty, do martial arts of several styles, play badminton and football, love live music, in fact play the piano and trumpet, love to travel and eat sushi, not that those two were ever exclusively linked. I like Sherlock Holmes stories, The Walking Dead, dogs, cats, jackets, and hats. At least that's what I wrote. On the surface, that is me. And everyone around me, that's me. Under my skin, though, I am very different. I don't need that match profile. It sits there unused. I found my love, and it's perfect. Whilst others, probably meeting through match or across crowded bars by force and exertion of their public characters, charm the pants off a soulmate, I'd found a lover who satisfies the real me. Her name is Sarah. I'd learned that from her driver's license. She was perfect in every detail. What I always wanted. Her height, her shape, her skin, her curled and natural fire-red hair. <laughs> I'd often heard that redheads like to be kinky and rough, and I made her to be no exception. Our love requires no words to express itself. We understand each other perfectly, and we never talk. She never can, with a three-inch ball gag pressed between her lips. She gurgles and whimpers as she rises in my grasp. Her soft tones are simply music to my ears and all I ever want to hear. I play with her, studying her naked body. <laughs> it's too tempting when I have her tied to my bed. As I did, I got to know her, what she likes and dislikes, to touch her here or touch her there, careering at my whim between pleasure and pain. <laughs> I was in complete control of her. For a long time I was nervous, though. I expected it to all come crashing down through a stern knock at my door, recorded interviews, wailing sirens, and a media frenzy. Though I did wonder whether a media frenzy and the sensationalist marvel at me would be cool. A chance to drop the act and publicly be myself. Evolved. But somehow that circus never came. Flyers went up and news bulletins screened for missing Sarah. A regional search and tearful, impassioned pleas from her wretched parents beamed to me in the comfort of my favorite chair. It seemed like I had the whole state wrapped around my little finger. There were, of course, leads and alleged sightings, but suspicion never floated my way. Why would it have? I was an admirer she, her friends, and family never knew she had. And she was far removed from the social circles I or any of my friends, even acquaintances, knew. I had been very careful and focused. I knew the world I wanted, and I was determined to create it and protect it. And so as our charmed life continued, I intensified my control. <laughs> the power I held over her was intoxicating. She rarely struggled, 
and her muffled protest and pleas became indistinguishable from her gurgled moans during our sessions. The only thing I could not conquer was the fire burning at me out from her eyes. I kept Sarah. I fed her, healthy and organic even. I bathed her, I clothed her, and I cared for her. I introduced her to a strict workout regime so her sculpted legs and stomach didn't waste away. She was in the shape of her life, tethered to the treadmill. She would run for hours every other day. Sometimes I let her feed herself. Sometimes I let her go to the bathroom herself. She always had a degree of mobility in the outfits I dressed her in. Eventually, I gave her a small TV for her room. She looked to me for everything. I was death or life to her, and that kind of love demanded her devotion to me. I could almost see it in her eyes now, beneath the embers of that fire and defiance. I would have her heart, mind, and soul. But as time drifted by, I noticed Sarah change. It had only been three years, but her once sun-kissed skin was now an unappealing pale white. Her hair had lost its radiance, and inexplicable lines had burrowed their way into her soft, immaculate face. I explained this all to her, and I told her that things would change. They had to. There was fear in her eyes when I pressed the chloroform-soaked rag over her nose and mouth. I suppose she thought I might kill her for a newer, younger conquest. But I am not a killer. I love her. I knew she was the one, and I had a plan. As she lay there unconscious, I took a plaster cast of her face, making sure to capture every detail of her delicate beauty. I removed the cast and spent hours smoothing out the lines that invaded and cursed her perfect features. It took me weeks of experimenting with materials, ratios, and volumes to get it all right. But finally, I cast her face perfectly. It felt like skin, soft, delicate, and elastic. But it would not tear and it would not age. Once I'd colored it to match the first photos I'd snapped of her, I got everything ready. I leant over Sarah, engaging her face to face, absorbing her trembling gaze to explain in detail the coming makeover. She listened to me intently, hanging on every word, her trembling intensifying as my words sunk in. I had her strapped down to an old salon chair I'd picked up at a garage sale a while back. I had added some additional customizations that allowed me to strap her down tightly, almost to the point of total immobility, and secure her head with a padded vise, the jaws clasping her head just behind the ears. For the first and perhaps last time in my presence, I had left her free to talk. Still, it wasn't until I finally revealed to her the new face that she spoke to me. She pleaded pitifully. I have to admit, I was hugely disappointed that this was how she used this new freedom I'd granted her. Angry, even, that her display damaged my fantasy of how I saw her. The fight had deserted her. The fire in her eyes was extinguished for the first time. My moment of triumph crumbled like ashes. This was too easy. I'd guessed that her apparent fate was not something she was prepared for, and in defeat she looked like an empty shell. This was not the girl I fell in love with. That girl had spirit! For the first time, I briefly considered that I might have to kill her. But as I stood there in silence, staring at her, holding her new face out in front of her, I saw that fire resurge in her eyes, and she spat words with venom and hatred. <laughs> Last act of defiance or not, the chase was on again, and my heart swelled. Sarah had fought her way back to me. Good girl. 
She cursed and shouted, muscles straining against the leather straps, unloading three years of fear, anger, and humiliation at me! <laughs> oh, I cut her off, tightening a strap looping down from the clamps of the vise under her chin, holding her jaw shut. <laughs> oh, Sarah continued to shout through clenched teeth, struggling bitterly against the restraints without her moving. <sighs> she did not stop fighting. She did not cry. Her pupils burned into me with ferocious intensity as I lazily applied an industrial 20-minute epoxy resin to the inside of the mask. Then I took one last look at her as she was now before reaching down to my helpless lover and beginning to press the mask to her face. Meticulously, I worked from the chin upwards, holding the edges of her new mouth over her lips and pressing the nostrils and eyelids gently into place. I sculpted over her delicate features until the skin fit her perfectly, all the way from her chin to her hairline. I made sure that her eyes and nostrils were clear of resin made sure all the edges were flawless and hidden. I checked her lips, pressing the edges to the inside of her cheeks, and made sure no resin was on her teeth or seeping into her mouth. Then I stood back and admired my lover's fresh new face. She was magnificent, still so beautiful in her panting, wide-eyed horror. She was screaming through her clenched teeth, and I could tell she was struggling desperately with the chair, even though she never moved. I switched on two pedestal fans and placed them on either side of her, and then I left her for the resin to cure. I'd come back in 25 minutes or so. Sarah would be reborn to me, blessed with eternal youth. Maybe, I thought. I could even make her entire body that perfect. My little model of perfection. You have been listening to Love Without Words by Davio 1986, starring the voice talent of Crystal Donahue as the narrator. Featuring the music from the composer, Kevin McLeod. Details featured in the description below. Morbid Butterfly intro card, end card, and icon created by Claura. Images used in this production featured in the description below. We thank you for watching. Until next time.